Good morning. It is fantastic to see all of you here today to hear and participate in this important discussion. Uh, first, I'd like to say um, happy St. Patrick's Day to all of you who are celebrating. I do see some green out there in the audience. Um, and then the first thing I'd like you to do is to please take a moment to silence your phones um, before we get going. Um, and I would like to welcome you to this morning's League of Women Voters program, Redistricting Who Wins, Who Loses. I'm Melissa Musliner. I'm a member of the Wyzetta Plymouth Area League and your moderator for today. Just to give you a little background on the League of Women Voters, we encourage informed and active participation in government, work to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influence public policy through education and advocacy. League of Women Voters Minnesota promotes political responsibility through informed and active participation in government and acts on selected governmental issues. Membership is open to all persons age 16 and over. We encourage you to become a member, to provide service to our community, and to join us in the nonpartisan studies of local, state, and national issues. The League of Women Voters does not support or oppose political parties or candidates. For more information about League of Women Voters, visit www.lwvmn.org. And of course, there are many members here today that you can speak with if you are interested in becoming a member as well. I will read three statements that outline the League of Women Voters position on redistricting. The League of Women Voters believes in representative government. The League of Women Voters of the United States principles are, the League of Women Voters believes responsibility for redistricting preferably should be vested in an independent special commission with membership that reflects the diversity of the unit of government, including citizens at large, representatives of public interest groups, and members of minority groups. The League of Women Voters of the United States Impact on the Issues 2016-2018 states support timely redistricting based substantially on population and affect all state and local government bodies, support regular and equitable reapportionment with definite procedures established to ensure prompt redistricting by the legislature or by a reapportionment commission. And finally, the League of Women Voters Minnesota Program for Action 2017-2019. Every 10 years, states undertake a process called redistricting. During this process, electoral maps are redrawn to account for changes in populations in different geographic areas. The new maps must create legislative and congressional districts that are almost exactly equal in population. Gerrymandering is the manipulation of district boundaries during this process for some sort of political advantage. Gerrymandering has been used historically to protect incumbents, dilute the voting power of communities, and entrench partisan control despite political disfavor. In Minnesota, the legislature controls the redistricting process. In theory, a set of district maps would be approved by the Minnesota House of Representatives and the Minnesota Senate, and then signed into law by the governor. But sometimes those parties cannot agree <laughs> They might think a map has been gerrymandered or puts their party at a disadvantage. When those parties cannot agree before their deadline, they rely on a court to draw the maps. Usually a court appoints a panel of judges to use the legislators' proposed maps <coughs> to create a final impartial map. And today we will be hearing from two attorneys on the subject. The first is former Minnesota Supreme Court Justice Paul Anderson who, as you likely know, has had a long and distinguished career. He is a graduate of McAllister College in St. Paul and graduate university at the Minnesota Law School. He was Special Assistant Minnesota Attorney General in 1970 and an attorney with Lavander, Gillen, and Miller in South St. Paul from 1971 to 1992. In 1992, he was appointed by Governor Arne Carlson as Chief Judge to Minnesota Court of Appeals, and then in 94, to Associate Justice Minnesota Supreme Court, 
by Governor Carlson, and he retired from that position in 2013. Since leaving the court, he has chaired the new Senate Office Building Design Build Committee, was a member of the State Capital Restoration Commission, co-chair of the Capital Art Subcommittee. He's done extensive lecturing, and I find this fascinating, in El Salvador, China, then. <laughs> China. I mean, we have our sources. I know that, I guess. Uh, in the Philippines, Russia, Tunisia, and Libya. Um, and he has hosted several groups of judges and lawyers from the Republic of Georgia. Uh, he presently teaches at the U of M Law School and other schools. Hopefully it's right. <laughs> <laughs> Justice Anderson is familiar with redistricting in Minnesota since 1970. He served as a second chair attorney for one of the parties in 1980, worked with the governor in 1990, and was involved with the 2000 and 2010 efforts as a member of the Minnesota Supreme Court. And I will just quick introduce Nick, and then we'll head to start, okay? Thank you. Um, our second speaker is Nick Harper. He is the Civic Engagement Manager from the League of Women Voters, Minnesota. And when I talked to Nick, he said, well, I don't have a storied career as a judge. And I said, well, give it time. So we'll look for him in the future. So Nick right now works with the local league voter services and collaborates with our community partners. He is a member and former co-president of the League of Women Voters of St. Paul. His policy interests include money and politics, voting rights, fair district maps, and other election law. Mr. Harper has a BA in political science from Gustavus Adolphus College and a JD with public service honors from the University of Iowa College of Law. And following Justice Anderson, he will speak on current legislation being presented at the 2018 legislature. So now, please help me introduce, um, excuse me, welcome, Paul Anderson. I'm uh, tempted to paraphrase Adlai Stevenson, who when he was, gave speeches, he would start by saying, my job is to speak to you for a while, your job is to listen to me for a while, and uh, I hope we finish our respective tasks about the same time. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here at the League of Women Voters. When I sworn in as Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals, uh, I, it's kind of spe some people surprisingly have me say is that the courts are not the place to get all s disputes resolved. In fact, sometimes the courts should be the last resort. Sometimes we have to be, because if not us, who? But I said that's not the best place. Often the, the biggest problems should be resolved in the legislature, by the governor, and I said that they should be discussed and sorted out in the public. And I talked about the value of civic sites. I quoted my predecessor, John Simonette, on uh, the civil sites in society. He talked about the church becoming uh, a source uh, uh, for resolving this, uh, disputes and becoming a civic. What I mean by civic sites, I mean the home, I mean the family, neighborhood, school, uh, churches, uh, uh, community organizations, Kiwanis, Lions, whatever, and the League of Women Voters. Because these civic sites are so critical to uh, creating dialogue and discussing issues in our society. And uh, we all know how polarized we are. I mean, I'm, I'm for having that frustration myself as being able to talk and engage with people. When I came on the court, I'm a farm kid. I grew up in Eden Prairie. I was a dairy farm. There were only 3,000 people in Eden Prairie. By the way, I'm not wearing orange today out of deference to St. Patrick's Day, but the southern part of Eden Prairie was settled by the Scotch-Irish, and uh, my ancestors uh, marched with uh, Queen Elizabeth's army into Northern Ireland in 1602. Uh, yes, and then when they ran out of land in Ireland, they came here and took over the land of the uh, Dakota and Lakota. So I got a sordid history of my family. Anderson Lakes out in Eden Prairie is actually named after my family. So I have some pretty deep roots out there. But now that you know why I'm not wearing green and be <laughs> grateful that I'm not wearing orange, I'm going to talk about the uh, topic today because the League play such an important role in uh, educating the people of our democracy. Uh, I have a lot of experience on redistricting. Uh, some of it's accidental. See, I'm an accidental justice. 
Arne Carlson was the accidental governor. I won't get into the sordid details uh, that led to him being placed on the ballot in uh, 1990. I uh, played a key role in that. I just dropped my law practice for about three and a half weeks and tried to work to get him on uh, the ballot. Some of you remember the write-in campaign. I knew we were never going to win a write-in campaign. But following the directions of Seneca and his description of luck, and I'm very lucky, and Arnie was lucky to be elected. But Seneca said that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. We didn't know if there would be an opportunity to be on the ballot or get back on the ballot, because under my superb leadership, you know, Arnie finished closer to third than he did to first. And you know how elections work, only the first place first it was on. But uh, we didn't know if the opportunity would come, but we figured we should be prepared. And we got lucky. We got on the ballot, the Supreme Court decision came out 7.30 on Thursday night before the election, and in short order, new ballots were issued, and Arnie won by 45,000 votes, even though there were a lot of absentee votes already cast. So I'm accidental. So observed it in 70, participant as a lawyer in 80, advisor to Carlson in 90, and then Supreme Court justice that oversaw redistricting in 2000, 2010. So it's pretty extensive experience uh, on uh, Minnesota redistricting. Now, what's going on now? We are living, by the way, both parties are, uh, you know, play around with uh, the redistricting. I mean, I, if I used to describe myself as a, well, I still describe myself as a Lincoln Grant, even a Garfield, Eisenhower, Stassen, Youngdahl, Republican, moderate. Uh, we don't exist anymore. Uh, but uh, through all my years up until uh, I got on the court where I couldn't be political, I was identified as Republican. I'm not sure I identify that. No, I'm pretty sure I don't identify that way anymore. <laughs> I guess I can say that I'm off the court because I think my party has left me for a number of reasons. Uh, but I've seen redistricting from both sides. I sometimes feel I should play the Joni Mitchell song, Both Sides Now, uh, because it would be appropriate. And I've had skepticism and a bit of cynicism for both how sides, both sides do it. And uh, what I want to do is to share my perspective. If you look at my glasses, they have a tint. You can't see the tint, but all of us have a tint. History belongs to those who write it and those who tell it. You've got to understand that uh, my telling of history gets distilled through my observations of, uh, of history. And so, I mean, in this day and age where people promote uh, fake news, uh, alternative facts, and outright lies, you've got to be sophisticated listeners to figure out, you know, make sure the sources are right and the person is credible. Because, uh, I mean, you have people that will outright lie. You have people who don't care about the truth. They're amoral toward the truth. I'm going to do the best I can, but understand, I'm human. And so you've got to distill what I say uh, through that lens. We are living right now at this time with the legacy of 2010. We had the very optimistic election change of Obama. And then you had, see, we, we have institutionalized revolutions in our country. It's called voting. We don't have a revolution every two years. We have the potential for it. But we had a series of revolutions in the first part of the 21st century, one in 2006 with respect to Congress, 2008 with respect to the presidency, and then we had a counter-revolution in 2010 where there was a pushback. And 2010 was the, remember, the age of the Tea Party and the conservative pushback. And again, that was another, from, from the Republican point of view, Seneca's words, mean a lot because they were looking for opportunity, they wanted to be prepared for it, and boom, it fell into the lap of the Republican Party after the 2010 election, which is a redistricting year, and they got control of, uh, not only into the Congress, but they got control of state legislators, because that's where it happens with respect to a redistrict, and I'll tell you why. And so, there are estimates, conservative estimates, and conservative, that's in the classic uh, dictionary term of conservative, there's probably 17 to 20 extra seats minimum 
in the Congress that go to the Republicans just because of their redistricting. Some uh, projections are more. Uh, the current margin in the House is uh, 24, so you can see how close that deals with control. It said here that I was, uh, I've traveled to the Philippines, China, Russia. I was in uh, Libya. I met with Ambassador Stevens. Remember Ambassador Stevens? What a wonderful person. I met with him three uh, months before he was killed. I can tell you all about Libya and Benghazi. It's a uh, fake canard, by the way, but uh, that was got to be used. But I've, I've done uh, a lot of that traveling, and I've been in involved, and uh, one of the places I went with Jack Young, he was one of Al Gore's attorneys. If you see the movie about Al Gore, he's the one that said, don't just count four counties, recount the whole state. You're gonna make a mistake, and Gore made the mistake. He wanted to focus on four counties. He thought he could push Bush into a corner with that recount in limited area, and it backfired on him. And uh, Jack Young still thinks that, uh, well, of the intentional votes, Gore would have won because of the butterfly ballots. But he thinks that on a legitimate recount, and that's what we do, as we did here with Coleman Franken, with a valid, of all validly cast ballots, uh, Bush still would have won Florida by about 320. It's, uh, that's one from one of Gore's attorneys, just the way recounts go and whatever. But I learned from Jack is the real fulcrum of power in Washington, D.C. is not the Senate. It's the House. It's because 435 members, staffers, committee control, whatever, that's the engine of that city. I mean, the Senate is important on judicial confirmations, whatever, but the real power in that city, which the industry of Washington, D.C. is power, centers around the House. So that's why congressional districts and the election of congressmen is so important. And of course, this is where redistricting comes into big play. Now, uh, you can see, I hope I can get this one. Gerrymandering is named after Eldridge Jerry. You can see it up there. Eldridge Jerry is uh, a real patriot of the country. He was the signer of the uh, Declaration of Independence, the uh, Constitution. He didn't sign the Constitution because he, like uh, some others, uh, didn't think that uh, it protected rights enough. So he didn't sign it, was a promoter for the Bill of Rights, which was added uh, four years afterwards in order to, as it was a condition of getting passed. He was governor of Massachusetts and actually became uh, Madison's second uh, vice president and died in office. Gary started out thinking that he didn't like party politics. He evolved over time and then this is the district that he designed in his home state of Massachusetts in order to guarantee that a person of his own party would be elected. It's named after Jerry, Governor Jerry, and it looked like a salamander. So when you think of gerrymandering, it's the governor with a, ro uh, with a reptile. Uh, a, uh, and that's, that's the cartoons that came out. So that's where we get the name. Gerrymandering's been with us for a long time. I just finished the biography of James Garfield, and I recommend you study Garfield because he was truly, truly a wonderful human being. And the doctors killed him, and the bullets, he could have survived that. It's horrible listening to that, how the doctors were just, well, anyway, I won't get into it, but he was. <laughs> but we have, uh, we, you know, front porch politics. You know, it used to be the front porch politics. The president wouldn't travel, but it came to be that people would come to uh, the front porch and the uh, president who went from Garfield all the way up to Harding and, well, he had that front porch because of uh, redistricting and gerrymandering. They wanted to uh, cause his defeat. He had a, uh, Ohio was growing in population. He had a well-balanced district and the other side controlled redistricting and they put him in a district with two predominantly Democratic counties. So he moved. This is one I like to show. This is, uh, Texas is infamous for its uh, uh, redistricting. And Austin is a liberal center in a very conservative state. 
They describe Austin as a blueberry in the midst of uh, a bowl of tomato soup. <laughs> and, uh, and so what they try to do here is to uh, dilute the liberal votes out of Austin. You see how many districts come in. There might be some uh, buyer's remorse on the part of the Republicans right now because uh, with the changing attitude of voters out there, they say that because of uh, the way they designed it, there's a chance of a couple of those districts flipping. And so, uh, see if I can pull up. Uh, I want to, I got to come, I got to show you, uh, I got to show you uh, goofy kicking Donald Duck. Yeah. Uh, you see, see, now this is, uh, not everybody, all the redistricting bad stuff is done by the, uh, uh, the. Oh, go back. Okay. I can see where it was. Okay. You can take me back to where I can get to the. I, but you can see this. Hey. Ah, there it is. Oh. This is Pennsylvania. This is Goofy kicking Donald Duck. Uh, but uh, Pennsylvania is just one of the most atrocious examples of uh, uh, redistricting that's been out there. Uh, I, gotta, I love this picture here. North Carolina, they have a, a district that uh, basically just is long and narrow. It's one of the worst examples. And, and so they asked the people, the Republicans in North Carolina, why did you design redistricting so you have 10 Republicans and only three uh, Democrats? The answer was, well, we couldn't make an 11-2 split work, so we had to settle for, I mean, this is, and it's somewhat the same response coming out of Wisconsin, Nevada, and so well, if you want to see what's happening, I just recommend you go to the site gerrymandering and pull up maps. And you'll see, you know, basically what's happening and the tactics used. I mean, it's, it's called cracking, splitting up votes in long districts. It's called compressing. Uh, some states don't allow uh, prison inmates to vote, but they have a large prison uh, population tends to be in a metropolitan area, where the, so they count that. I mean, it's all kinds of tricks that are used with respect to redistricting. Now, why are we having such a big issue about it now? And I think the answer in part is, and, and I'm going to use the term carefully because I'm going to come back to it in Minnesota content. I think the Republicans got greedy. They went too far. And they designed some really uh, atrocious districts. So it's gotten to the point that it's, uh, uh, I'm going to try and get out of this so that uh, they designed some really atrocious districts. So it's really bad. Now, the Supreme Court of the United States doesn't like to deal with redistricting because it's a, uh, I'm not the biggest fan of the. U.S. Supreme Court right now, I've had to apply too much of their jurisdiction and their jurisprudence, and I find it in some ways uh, not the soundest in my point of view. Uh, but I can understand why they don't want to deal with redistricting, because they see that as a seminal political issue, uh, both a capital P partisan and a small p dealing with power. And they don't want to interfere with what they would describe as democracy at work. Uh, I'm not terribly sympathetic to uh, Justice Roberts when he said he hates having to deal with issues like that. He shouldn't. As a justice of the Supreme Court, that's part of his duty. And uh, when he refers to the whole process of being a bunch of gobbledygook, sometimes I wish uh, some of the justices are you recording this? I'm going to be in trouble. Some of the justices should have some more real world in the trenches experience. And I think that we get too many people who were clerks, staffers, circuit court judges. And then, I mean, real world experience is helpful to understand how to deal with issues like we have redistricting. And yes, I believe in restraint, I believe in the limited use of the court's power, but 
question I often asked in situations, tough ones like this, is that if not us, who? If not us, who? Especially when I believe in what Alexander Hamilton said when talking about the role of a independent, limited juris not limited jurisdiction, restraint-oriented court that had the independent role to guard society, that to protect society against the ill humors that may arise from the people themselves. This is a very important. Ill humors that can originate with the people themselves. We need to understand that some, we do some bad things. We're kind of misguided from time to time. And is that the most formal law is the Constitution to guarantee everybody's right. And the courts should step in when these ill humors rise to the level which I think uh, gerrymandering is done in redistricting. Now, so we got a bad place in our history right now. We have uh, gerrymandering that's gone off the charts, crazy. It's done that, and I'll revisit this a little bit, because of the commu computer modeling that we can do. When I started redistricting, the type of districts that I was showing you, these long curves, no way could we have done that. We didn't have sophisticated enough tools. In our, I mean, we had maps that we cut out pieces and put here and there, and we had to keep, we, we didn't have the ability to do that. But computers started on the scene and having some impact in 1990, and by 2000, 2010, they were ubiquitous. And by the way, they're refining even better redistricting computer models. I mean, the, the panel that we had, said they could say, okay, we need another 500 votes over here in this district. Give us 500 votes, where should we take it? And the computer would come up with options. And then they'd tell us everything, how it affected the other. I mean, it is really, really sophisticated stuff. And so uh, we have to be very wary that, uh, you know, I mean, I, I see the computers and the internet as a mixed blessing. I, I believe in it, I follow it, whatever. But we need to be sophisticated enough to deal with and understand what this technology is doing to us as a society and be able to deal with it. So. I've got to watch my time here. What I am going to do, the main thing, is to tell you a little bit about how redistricting has gone in Minnesota. You and I talked, Nick, earlier. Nick gave me a short answer. It's an accident. <laughs> am I correct? That, that is what I said. <laughs> uh, uh, in a way, it is. In a way, it isn't. But uh, we've been fortunate. I said, maybe it's an act of God, Nick, you know? <laughs> maybe, the, maybe some higher power is looking after Minnesota, you know? But we've been pretty lucky because uh, I could be coming here and telling you the horror stories about redistricting in Minnesota, but I'm not. I'm gonna tell you how we got along pretty well. Uh, Barker, uh, Baker versus Carr, Reynolds versus Sim came down for the US Supreme Court, one man, one vote, uh, saying that a Senate has to be uh, uh, you can't have it on geographic. You've got to have both houses of the legislature based on population. And we had a Minnesota legislature in 1962 with Governor Elmer L. Anderson as governor. The uh, liberals controlled the House. The conservatives controlled the Senate. That was back before party designation. And you had the potential for some really major divide because uh, redistricting hadn't been done for a long time. You knew for sure that some rural legislators were gonna lose their job because the population of the metro area. But we had some really strong leadership. They emerged and said, we gotta do it. So they called a special session. And uh, in the fall, I think of 61, uh, they got together in a redistrict Minnesota. Last time it's been done by the legislature. Uh, there was a quasi-legislative one that was done in 90, but uh, last time the, both houses and the governor agreed. You now move forward to 1970. Uh, you have a slightly different situation. You have Wendell Anderson coming in as governor. You still have liberal conservative uh, uh, designation in the, uh, in the legislature, and you have a divided... Uh, I'm looking back, conservative control of both the House and the Senate, 
for the DFL governor when redistricting is going. They come to loggerheads. Well, the alternative is to go to the court. And they do. And they go to federal court. This is an important distinction to me. They went to federal court and they had a three judge panel appointed to handle redistricting. Gerald Haney out of Duluth was a circuit court judge. And then you had uh, Earl Larson, federal district court judge, and Edward Devitt. Now, I've come to respect Gerald Haney as a judge. He was a good judge in many ways, but he was very, very political. I mean, he just couldn't. He, was, he had a passion for politics, and he was going to make sure that, you know, democratic interests were taken care of. Now, it's not a bad motivation because Gerald Haney was a uh, colleague, friend, and worked with Hubert Humphrey, Orville Freeman, uh, uh, Don Fraser, Art Nafflin, and they were in the minority as Democrats or DF, uh, farmer labor for a long period of time. Uh, Humphrey led the charge to unite the Democrats and the farm laborites, kicked the communists out of the Democratic Party. A lot of people don't remember that, but uh, you go up to the range, there's still grandchildren who don't like Humphrey because he kicked the Democrats out of the Democratic Party. But it was a tough, tough struggle. And so they got into power, and so it's kind of a natural orientation to keep power. And Haney was oriented towards that. Don Larson came out of the law firm where uh, most of the Democrats, uh, Freeman, uh, uh, Mondale practice. And so it was a DFL oriented panel majority. And Ever Devitt, who was, yes, he was a Republican congressman, was beaten by Gene McCarthy in 48. But he was not as aggressive as Haney and uh, Earl Larson. Aggressive is a word to describe what they did because that panel decided they were going to reduce the size of the legislature. From uh, 135 representatives and 67 senators, they're going to cut it down to 35 senators and 105 uh, representatives because it was just too big. Well, we learned a lesson about judicial redistricting from that because they got shot down with that idea big time. He went up on appeal and said, no way. And, and that's where we get the doctrine of least change plan. If the courts is going to be involved in redistricting, you try to do the least change involved. And I'll come back to that uh, concept. So they got shut down on that. And here's another thing. I, I mean, and I'll, I'll say another thing. You know, I, I told earlier about we, it's good to have judges who had some real life experience and been in the trenches. Literally speaking, Gerald Haney was in the trenches. He was on a landing craft on the 6th of June, 1944, landing on the beaches of uh, Normandy. He was third in command of his boat. The captain who was in charge, they dropped the front. He turned to his troops and said, follow me. And he got shot and died on the spot. The next up followed in and said to troops, I'm going to lead you, follow me. And he got, was getting off the landing craft. He got shot and killed. Haney's turn came and said, guys, we're going over the side. <laughs> true story, true story. But he experienced that. So, I mean, he's had some real life tough experiences. So, I mean, he's, he's truly speaking, in the uh, uh, meaning of the word, he was battle tested. And so that's kind of the people that we had. But here's the thing I'm going to come back, the difference between post-2010 and what happened in 2000 or uh, 1970. Oh, by the way, I, I'm familiar. I wasn't involved in it, but my law school classmate, Alan Weinblatt, filed the lawsuit. My law school classmate, Dick Beans, was the plaintiff. The name of the lawsuit is Beans versus Erdahl. <coughs> Arlen Erdahl was the Secretary of State. And Beans lived in a district in Anoka that where there's you know, the great white uh, uh, sand plains of north of the uh, Hennepin County there is it in Anoka County. Population was moving out of North Minneapolis, and so it was really a district that's out of balance. So Dick was a great plaintiff in that case, and uh, uh, and so I'm pretty familiar with how they pushed it. Uh, 
But despite the DFL orientation, and some of us in the Republican Party viewed uh, Judge Haney as the devil incarnate. I mean, he was just the, really, I'm seriously, I mean, is that how attitudes can change with perspective. He was, they didn't overreach. They didn't overreach. They protected their interests, but did it in a way that wasn't uh, uh, overreaching. And uh, I, I can tell you one story. Jack Fina was an attorney representing the, uh, the DFL, and he was before the judges, and the judges, and sometimes judges get a little removed from reality. And so they thought they had the best thing since sliced bread when they were reducing the legislature. So they asked Jack Fina, said, why can't the legislature do that? And he says, Judge, for an incumbent legislature to reduce the size, it's like gouging out one of your eyes. It just doesn't happen. And see, the judges didn't uh, realize that. Well, we came through that redistricting pretty well, although the Republicans didn't like it. Now, in 1980, again, Haney was uh, head of the panel. Uh, I think uh, uh, it was, again, a balance. From a Republican point of view, we always used to say those three judge panels, you'd have two strong Democrats and a weak Republican. And even sometimes it was bad enough that the weak Republican would file a dissent. But again, redistrict. Interesting enough, my law firm, Paul Magnuson, anybody recognize that name? Uh, you know, former federal judge, excellent federal judge. He and I actually were representing the uh, uh, House Republican minority. And we had maps in our conference room, moving them around, cutting them out. It was so archaic. And so we didn't have much influence, but we wanted to figure out what was happening. But it was really a rudimentary way of trying to uh, redistrict. And uh, again, no overreaching. Favored the Democrats but it wasn't overreaching. Now let us come to 1990. As they say, I'm an accidental justice because I was appointed by an accidental governor. And uh, we got on the ballot four days before the election, as I said. Uh, and the Republicans thought, okay, we're okay now. Uh, the Democrats hold control of the House and the Senate, but we got the governorship. And those who remember your history, that's the year of the botched veto. Uh, the House and Senate passed a DFL-oriented redistricting plan, and the governor was going to veto it, and he didn't veto it in time. I feel badly for Arnie on that, because the real blame on this situation rests squarely on the shoulders of his uh, governor's counsel. I, I can give you the name of the person, but he was a bit arrogant. He thought he was on his way to a judgeship. His wife was already measuring the judicial robes for her husband, whatever. But he was in way over his head, and he didn't uh, do good service for the governor. In fact, this is the way government works in Minnesota. The attorney general's office is headed by a politician who runs for election. But you need to understand, I was part of that office, that the, the real political people in that office number somewhere around six to eight. Mm -hmm. The rest of those attorneys are dedicated public servants and want to do the public good. Nick knows that. And even someone like Tunheim, Jack Tunheim, who was the chief of staff and was solicitor general, who was tied closely to Humphrey, knew that he is a public servant. So in March of 1991, Jack Thunheim prepared a well-written, extensive memo outlining exactly what Arnie needed to do to veto legislation. Chapter and verse, boom, boom, boom. And so I talked to Jack after the botched veto, and I said, Jack, why didn't you do your job and advise the governor how to do a proper veto? He said, Paul, I did. I sent a memo over in March. So then I talked to the governor's attorney. I said, Tom, did you receive any directive or information from the Attorney General's office? He said, yeah. What'd you do with it? Oh, I put it here. Said, this is literally, I mean, unbelievable. I put it here in my lower desk drawer. He never looked at it. And so that sets up a, an interesting scenario in 1990 where you now have Don Lay, district judge, Democrat, LBJ, uh, appointee who's turned conservative and is 
really uh, a Republican about that time, Paul Magnuson, who has a Republican background, and then a third federal district judge who was Democrat. So, okay, we're all right, because Don Lay is, you know, doesn't like the Democrats, whatever, except the Supreme Court is changing the rules with respect to redistricting. Scalia is one of the leads on this. He said, the federal court is not the place to do it. It's the state court. And it got worse because Sandy Keith, Chief Justice, didn't get along with Don Lay. Oh, it was really kind of acrimonious. That's why we didn't get a plan until 1994 until instead of 1992. But the bottom line was the state had jurisdiction. So Sandy Keith appointed a three-judge panel, Harriet Lansing, Bill Walker, and Bill Moss. Again, I look at that and say, oh, two strong Democrats, and Moss is just, just a kind of a tepid Republican. But they were limited in what they could do because they had to take a look at a plan that was passed and not vetoed and had to look to see if it was close enough to pass muster. So they didn't develop a plan. They were reviewing a plan. And with a few tweakings on that, we got basically a Democratic plan of redistricting in the 1990. Now, it's interesting that by the end of that decade, the Republicans were able to take control of the House of Representatives. Again, there was no overreaching. Taking care of your people, but not overreaching. So again, Minnesota's been lucky and fortunate because of our kind of our good government attitude. And so we got some fallout from that. Now we go to the year 2000. I mean, life and history is really kind of funny and weird because with my experience on redistricting, now I'm winding up, I'm on the Supreme Court. I, I'm in one of those people who's in control. And, uh, and by the way, the Republicans are really excited now because the majority on the court are Republican appointees of Arnie Carlson. So we're gonna even things up all right now and they're gonna take care of all the past ills and whatever. Well, they didn't understand me. And uh, I always, and still am of the opinion that if we do a fair redistrict in the state of Minnesota, either party can win, but do it fairly. And so it started out, it didn't start out well. Uh, one of the justice, chief justice issued an order that was kind of unilateral, said we're gonna have a three judge panel. And we're gonna do I didn't like three judge panels because my experience with three judge panel was if you get a two to one vote and you're likely to get it, you don't know if they're right or wrong. It might be motivated by, and so internally on the court, I engaged in a major behind the scenes battle to have a five judge panel. Because with five, you have a better chance of knowing if they're doing it right. If it's 5-0, oh, that's surely right. If it's 4-1, it's probably right. If it's 3-2, then you better look at it carefully. And we could appoint a broader base. Ed Toussaint, Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals, probably a Democrat, but as apolitical as anybody, just fair, fair, fair. Tom Kalidowski, he's a Perpich appointee, but still pretty fair, whatever. Peg Lissetti from the Iron Range, you got to have somebody from the North, probably a Democrat, don't know. And then Shell House and Worky, uh, Republican, but not stridently so. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, we put, put them on there for all of a particular purpose. I know I went down and talked to Kalatowski, and I think uh, Blatz did too, Chief Justice. He said, and I went down to Kalatowski, you know why you're on this panel, Tom, don't you? You're on there because we don't want any mistakes. Mm -hmm. You have enough political savvy to not make some big mistakes. And a big mistake is to pair too many women, incumbents against women because women were coming on the scene and there's a tendency to pair them with each other, is to do the process right so the public are invested in it. And they did a wonderful job. And, they, and what they did, and we're living with that legacy, was first, you have the party stuff. Give us the criteria you think we should follow for redistricting. So the parties, and I mean, that puts a burden on them because you can't overreach if you're gonna be uh, putting your uh, template against the other. And they took about 80% of what the party said and blended it, and then they added their own. And they did something else that's very important to redistrict. They hold, held public hearings. They went all over the state. They met with city mayors, councilmen, uh, county commissioners, school officials, 
they went out to determine what would be the community of interest that we need to combine. That is a very key thing. And afterwards, they came down with their order on March 19th of uh, 2002. No appeal. You had people who didn't like it, but they saw it as fair. And we were one of the few states that did redistricting this way. And no appeal. Some people got hurt. A friend of mine, Mary Jo McGuire, uh, she got paired against Alice Hausman. Um, hated that. I said, well, I, you know, can't protect you. We just had it. By the way, we paired her against Jan, uh, John Marty again in 2012. Uh, so twice she got put up against. She's now a, a Ramsey County Commissioner. And he said she's got more power to do good there than she had in the legislature. Uh, but I mean, and oh, another thing. We didn't want incumbents paired against incumbents where it wasn't necessary. But in the congressional districts, we paired uh, they'd paired, and we had to sign off on it, Mark Kennedy uh, against Bill Luther. Now, I don't know if that was a mistake or not. Reason being is that Harvard County, Watertown, was in the second district. Wright County uh, was in the sixth district. Mark Kennedy was from the second. Bill Luther was from the uh, sixth. Mark Kennedy's address was Watertown in the second, new second district. What a, but he lives 660 feet on the other side of the boundary line between Carver County and Wright County. So we we'll wound up pairing Mark Kennedy and uh, Bill Luther in a district that could favor Kennedy. Bill, uh, Bill Luther never forgave his friend Jim, <laughs> Jim Gilbert, who was on the court for not taking care of him. Well, we couldn't take care of him, we wouldn't. I have gone to Tom Kalatowski probably 15, 20 times, and I've asked him, Tom, did you make a mistake? And Tom just looks at me with a smile on his stony face and said, you'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it tells you of the human aspect of uh, uh, redistricting. Now, uh, 2010, uh, it went pretty much the same way because we had a template in place that was followed pretty much in 2010 as we did in, in the 2000 census. And if, in fact, it goes to the court again in 2020, you can pretty much plan on that same model. The 2010 redistricting uh, was a close deal. This is where Nick says it's kind of an accident. Yeah, and I asked, uh, an accident, how many votes of an accident? Is it something close to 9,000? Exactly. That's the margin that Dayton won. Because the uh, uh, Republicans took the House and the Senate, but you had uh, Mark Dayton, Democrat elected governor, and so you had loggerheads, and so it was pretty much assumed it's going to go to the court. And we did it again. They did it. Issued this order. No appeal. No appeal again. So we came close in 2010 being like Wisconsin. We could very much be in the part of that lawsuit before the court went out. But again, we did uh, uh, a pretty well, pretty fair redistricting. So what does the future hold? Well, that's what's happening right now. People are very worried about the future. You have articles like this uh, coming out. Democratic Governor's Conference putting $20 million aside for advertisements, targeting states where it's going to be important to get a balance, you know, if you can't control the legislature, they're going to control the governor's office uh, because that's where the stakes are. Uh, it's, uh, the issue is in the court. This is an article about the Republicans getting too greedy. As I said earlier, the courts don't want to handle those things. But uh, if you overstep, whether they like to or not, they're uh, uh, getting involved. And so what are some of the simple criteria and, and I, this is where I disagree with Justice Roberts. Yeah, you don't like to deal with it, but you can set some templates and criteria. And you start point with the districts that exist. You got the least change plans model from the courts telling you that. Uh, generally, don't follow the redistricting plans of the parties because they're going to be biased to their own. Uh, but get the parties to outline the criteria. Look to the unique features of local communities, cities, counties, school districts, 
regional development areas, educational areas. Uh, and you pay attention to that and you seek and get public opinion. So you develop a template. You can still play games, but if you develop that template of information, it's harder to deviate from a plan that overreaches. So there are easily uh, criteria, identifiable, identifiable boundaries, a river, interstate highway. There are all of these things that come into play. And, uh, and then I got, what have I got, five minutes left? I gotta worry about that. Uh, <laughs> talking too long. I love this, I mean, thing I go on. Uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you here a, a, real quickly, you can look. This is the map of the congressional districts in uh, 62. You can see what happens. Uh, again, they change, but somewhat the same form. You still have outstate, kind of going from four and a half outstate to four outstate. You see how the population changes, and you see where now 8th district kind of goes a little bit south. You have the 7th district to the west, and uh, oh, I'm it's somewhat the same thing as the one I really want to look at here. This is the 2002 when the court had it. The big question this year, 2002, do you take and cut off the northern third of Minnesota and make it one district? That's a reasonable way to go. Uh, or do you do the border to border down here in the south? And the criteria that the court used was, well, the population in the existing 8th district doesn't change that much. If we take a little bit of Beltrami County, we could pretty much keep that intact. And this is the northern pine area of the state, the area of the Red River Valley. This area is agricultural. It's, it's hard to get for Colin Peterson to get from the north to the south, but there's a unity of interest as far as economy goes there. Down here, this is Tim Wall's district, uh, one here, Interstate 90. Interstate 90 goes border to border, and you make a district that's easy to travel, and you just go 25 miles south and 50 miles north, and you're in that district. So that's the criteria, good, bad, or different, that's the criteria that they use. And then you go into uh, uh, 2012, you see again the decrease in outstate population. Uh, Colin District, and uh, Colin Peterson's district gets bigger. Walls is somewhat the same, but encroaches to the north, and the second district uh, now extends down to Wabasha because Wabasha is far enough away from Interstate 90 and it, a lot of people from Red Wing commute to the cities. So I mean they're, they're using a the right criteria. There's a logic and method to it. I mean you start with some givens, you know, Canada on the north, Dakota's on the west, and <laughs> Wisconsin on the east, and uh, uh, Iowa on the south. Another given is courts least change. You, the Republicans really just, oh, they were salivating over the prospect of putting Minneapolis and St. Paul in the same district. But those are traditionally, historically uh, separated centers of interest since the 1890s. So the court's not going to combine those two. Uh, and then so you, you start with the outstate districts, you got the two core, and then you got the three that center around the city. And uh, that's how you do the redistricting. It's, Third district is pretty clear, western part of Hennepin County. You try to make the second district compact, and then the sixth district is the mishmash. It's the leftovers. Uh, that's the long and the short of how you do it. There's logic, logic to it. Now, I'm gonna, one thing we're gonna, I asked somebody, can you give me, does somebody have the population of the United States? You're gonna pull it up for me. It should be 300 some. 326.1, okay. Can you divide that by 435? I did that already. 740, 750,000. Okay, now what's the population of Minnesota? 5.63,000. And so, uh, so you should get a number somewhere between seven and eight. Yes, I got 7.51. That's the rub for 2020. We have in the past, a few to redistricting, been overrepresented. Are we going to lose? Uh, and we probably will. And for congressional districts, that's kind of fruit basket upset. So I'm going to turn it over to Nick, and we'll leave it for uh, question and answers uh, uh, at that time. But I
I, I hope I gave you a little bit of a, a background as to how it's happened. Uh, and with that information, to give you the information and ability to deal with what's coming. Thank you. That was a lot of great information, and thank you very much, Justice Anderson. I plan on talking a little bit, um, touching on some of the things that you mentioned, and then talking a little bit about the current uh, legislation and p possible reform uh, by looking at what other states do. And um, one plan that nobody does, but maybe Minnesota might do. Here in Minnesota, we, as Justice Anderson pointed out, the legislature is supposed to make the maps, and then when they can't decide or can't agree, it goes to the court, and the court usually appoints a panel. Uh, that tends to be an expensive litigation process sometimes. Um, and the intent behind the law is that the legislature would draw the map. And uh, we've had to use the backup system of the court drawing it since, what did you say, 1960s? Since the, 1970s, since the 1970s. So, uh, you know, after decades and decades of that having to use our backup system, um, some of the concerns are maybe we should change it so that we're not using our backup system all the time and we're doing it right the first time. Um, and there is some concern where, uh, you know, you do have many advocates who say, well, yes, we're using the backup system, but we still have a fair map because the court draws the map. So we're still ending with a fair result, so it's fine. Uh, but you do have other people who are concerned because you say, well, that only happens, in my opinion, for example, you know, that only happens by accident because you have a split legislature or a split between the legislature and the governorship. If we're one party to control uh, both of those or all of those, you could very easily get a very gerrymandered map. Um, and then the response is, well, you could always just sue and you know, litigate that map to get it corrected if it's gerrymandered. True, but that can also be a very long and expensive process as well. Uh, for example, we've seen in Pennsylvania where they, uh, the league actually is the main party in that case, and they challenged a gerrymandered map in Pennsylvania, and they just won the case in 2018, and even that's being appealed. So it's, they're eight years into the map, and it's still ongoing. And by the time they finish all this litigation, they'll only have the new map for maybe a year or two before they have to redraw the map all over again. So litigation is an option, but it's so long and so expensive that we want to avoid that as much as possible. So there are two types of, um, uh, two types of legislation in Minnesota that are happening that regard redistricting. Um, they haven't received a lot of attention this legislative session, I think mostly because there, couldn't, there wasn't a lot of agreement last session, and this session they're mostly focused on bonding bill, opioids, um, things like that. So not a lot of talk about it, but we're still going to be looking and watching closely. But there are two types of litigation. The first is the changes to the methods, and so that's when we talk about does the legislature do it, does the court do it, does someone else do it? And then the second type is the establishment of principles. So the principles are what Justice Anderson was talking about when he was talking about communities of interest. Uh, often we try to uh, keep together um, or give fair, fair and accurate representation to uh, minority communities with minority uh, of racial background or language use um, and try to give them effective representation. There's also uh, principles like keeping it contiguous and compact. Sometimes some states use competitiveness as a principle. So there are many, many principles. Um, in the past, those principles have been set up every year by the parties, the, the court, that draw it. The parties will each propose, and then the court establishes each, each cycle its own set of principles. Uh, this le legislation would establish the principles in statute so that they're clear to everyone ahead of time and that they're already agreed upon by the, by the legislature and it written into law, rather than having to do it ad hoc every 10 years. So those are the two types. Um, the principles, I mean, usually are pretty good because a lot of those principles are already set up in uh, established law, either the court system, through litigation, um, or just practice. So those are pretty good. The s methods of 
uh, redistricting is a little more contentious because there are many individuals who very strongly believe that the legislature should be the people to draw the maps themselves. Uh, and then you have other people, uh, a lot of reformers, who say, well, that's kind of like leaving the foxes to guard the hen house. You'll have legislators drawing their own maps, and then kind of the legislators will end up picking their voters rather than the voters picking their legislators to some degree. Um, so one reform method that has been proposed in Minnesota is, uh, and this is unique to Minnesota, it's not adopted anywhere else, and it's called the Carlson-Mondale Plan because it was developed in part by uh, Governor Arne Carlson and Vice President Walter Mondale. Uh, this plan would essentially skip the legislative fight and skip over the litigation and go straight to a panel of judges. So it would be a, uh, the majority leader of the Senate, the minority leader of the Senate, the Speaker of the House, and the minority leader of the House would each appoint one judge to the panel, and then those four judges would then pick one-fifth judge who would be the chair of the Independent Redistricting Commission. Those judges would then develop principles uh, based off the parties um, and then draw the maps. So it skips over the legislative fight and the litigation so that we don't have to waste time or money on that process. <laughs> um, so the backup system becomes the actual main system. Um, like I said, that hasn't been a step that hasn't been used anywhere before, and that's kind of unique to Minnesota. Uh, other states have used um, various methods. There are a lot of states that use uh, commissions, and some of them are independent, and some of them are not. Um, sometimes there are individuals that are appointed by, again, the speaker and in, uh, the governor, et cetera. Um, but those don't necessarily have to be bipartisan or nonpartisan. You do have a couple of states like California and Arizona that have uh, independent commissions that are required to be balanced. I think in Arizona, they actually require that only two can be of the majority party, only two can be of the minority party, and then the final two cannot be from either one. So they require it to be, you know, like a Green Party or a Democratic Socialist Party or whatever, you know, a third party, one of the minor parties. Um, and those, are, those boards are made up of citizens rather than judges. There are some complications there. There are some people who criticize that because they believe that maybe citizens don't have the, the expertise to do it. Uh, or that you know, when we have the judges under the, uh, the Carlson-Mondale plan, the judges would be required to stick to the judicial code of conduct. So there's a certain ethic that goes behind that that they would be required to adhere to. With a citizens commission, um, you know, there are guidelines in that they sh of how they should act, but with, you know, judges, they spend their whole lives and their whole careers, you know, trying to uh, adhere to this code of conduct. So it's much easier for them to understand the importance and adhere to that. Uh, in California, there were allegations that the chair of the commission was really not uh, as nonpartisan they were supposed to be. Same in Arizona, although I do believe that in Arizona that was more of a personality conflict than a partisan issue. But the situation is that uh, you've removed the legislature, you know, the foxes are out of the hen house now, but you still have some complications of exactly how are the maps being drawn and by who, and what is the standards of, um, of the individuals drawing those maps. You do have a couple of states that have a lot of advisory commissions, so they do not actually, um, they draw the maps, but they don't actually have final say. Usually it's the legislature that has final say over the maps. Um, and sometimes they're, uh, they don't even, a couple of, there are a couple of versions where the independent uh, commission would, the advisory commission would draw the map, and then the legislature gives a thumbs up or thumbs down. They are not allowed to make any edits. There are other versions where you, the advisory commission will draw the map, but then it's like purely advisory. The legislature gets, still gets to draw its own map um, and can disregard the advisory commission altogether, which in my opinion is kind of like, well, what was the point of the advisory commission? <laughs> um, so there's that. And then uh, you do have Iowa, which I want to point out because Iowa is its own little thing. Uh, Iowa has a nonpartisan staff draw the map. 
Uh, so in the equivalent of that here in Minnesota would be the Legislative Coordinating Commission, the House Research Department, and the Senate Council. Um, those are nonpartisan staff members, civil servants, who would draw the maps, uh, and then those maps go to the legislature for a thumbs up or thumbs down. The legislature can't draw the maps, the legislature can't edit the maps. They do get final say, but, um, and I think, they, I think in Iowa they get one or two, like two to three choices. Like they'll say, these are the three proposed maps, you have to pick one of them. Um, and that's unique because no one else, well, you know, regardless of who draws the maps, whether it be the legislature, an advisory commission, et cetera, there will be usually some nonpartisan staff advising. Uh, but here, the, the nonpartisan staff draw the maps and really have some control over the process. So Iowa is very unique in that sense. Uh, I, will, I do want to just touch up on a couple of points that Justice Anderson talked about. Um, I think he talked about the use of uh, computers to aid the gerrymandering and redistricting process, which I think is a great point, because in the past, uh, redistricting has been done, think of it like a saw. You know, they've been using like a very large saw to cut the shapes. We actually uh, use the scissors. <laughs> or scissors, there you go. Um, whereas nowadays, it's, uh, as one court put it, with surgical precision. And so you're using a scalpel nowadays, which makes it much easier to gerrymander and much harder to detect the gerrymandering, which is why it's so important uh, and why it's come up uh, is because it's so much easier to gerrymander, that's why it's such a high issue. Um, in addition to you know, the last decade or so, which has shown some really increased efforts to gerrymander. I wanna go over the principles and, see, and show you all some of the principles that were suggested so this is uh, one of the, the principal, this is the actual bill that was proposed um, as amended. Um, and some of these are really, usually the principles are pretty benign. It's just the biggest issue and question is there are a couple that don't always get included. For example, uh, competitiveness is one where a lot of states disagree whether or not it's good to try to make a district competitive. Uh, some people will argue you want to make districts competitive because then you get more, more moderates and more compromises in the legislature, which makes the legislature able to be more effective. You get other people who say you don't want competitive districts because that will you're diluting the vote of uh, less moderate individuals. Um, and you really shouldn't be, you're in a sense, gerrymandering those people off the map or out of the map. You will also, um, not all the states include uh, this provision here. Districts must not be drawn for the purpose of protecting or de defeating an incumbent. Not all the states include that uh, because there, in the past there have been um, states that have been drawing maps to protect an incumbent so that a person can get reelected uh, the next year. Um, and I do wanna go over uh, let's see, preserving communities of interest. This is where Justice Anderson talked about the different economic communities, such as you know, protecting an ag agricultural community and keeping them together. Um, minor civil divisions. Uh, this is where, uh, to the extent possible, the commission or the, the legislative, the drawing authority would avoid splitting up a county or a city if they can avoid it. Uh, now, in some places, like where, like Minneapolis, where you have such a dense concentration of people, it's unavoidable. You're going to have to split up to some degree. Um, but uh, in a lot of places, you can still, you know, encompass the en entire county without having to split that county up. So we want to avoid that when possible, because the idea is that you don't want to split a county up between two different representatives. Uh, you would rather have one county represented by one representative. Um, most of these are really, really um, obvious and everyone agrees to, but there are still like some fine tuning details. So for example, equal population, uh, this one says that the, and this is mandated by law that, that districts have to be substantially equal in population. Uh, and the court has set like a, a minimum of what that is, of the, or the maximum variation, but states can set a lower maximum of variation so that there's more fine tuning and more closely uh, equal population sizes. And so sometimes uh, there's debate over whether it should be 0.5 or should it be 0.75% variation or 0.1% variation. 
Uh, so you might get a little bit of debate about that as well. Um, uh, Justice Anderson did touch on cracking and packing, uh, which are, uh, he called it compressing. Uh, so that's as happened in Austin, where it was the blueberry and the tomato soup bowl. Uh, cracking is where they cracked it apart so that Austin was part of five different districts. As Justice Anderson pointed out, those districts have changed a little bit so that they might flip blue. Um, if under a, a hypothetical where I was a devious uh, Republican, the, what you would do if you wanted to gerrymander that map in the next cycle is that you would pack Austin back together into one district so that you sacrifice the one district, but you save the other four. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what packing is or compressing, as Justice Anderson called it. You also have um, hijacking, which is where you draw a map so that two incumbents are in the same district all of a sudden, uh, which uh, Justice Anderson didn't talk about that situation, which I don't think that was necessarily intentional in that situation, but there have been maps where that was intentional, and they did want to force two incumbents to run against each other. You also have kidnapping, where an incumbent used to be in one district, and suddenly they're drawn into a new district. So they're representing all new people, people they've never met before, or they might know, but they've never represented. And so they are kidnapped away from their home district. And then, rare but occasional, you also have sweetheart gerrymandering. <laughs> this is where the parties will get together and they will actually agree on a map, uh, but it is still gerrymandered because it both of the two major parties protect each other to ensure that they each keep the districts they want. They say, you get to keep that district, we get to keep this district, we're both okay with it. Usually it's used as a method of preventing um, challengers to incumbents uh, and to prevent competitive maps uh, so that the parties or the candidates don't have to run really vigorous and competitive election uh, races, they can just slide. By <laughs> with their own district. Um, so you do occasionally do get gerrymandering that's even agreed upon by the two major parties or the people drawing the maps. Um, I think that's, I was really short, but I'm more than happy to answer lots of questions, and I think that's the next part. Well, we are very fortunate this morning to hear from both of these gentlemen. I think the justice painted a very broad historical uh, picture. Um, and then we've had Nick, who's really taken us down right into the details of the legislation. Um, so now we do have an opportunity to hear from you um, to have questions. I think they'll remain seated and use the microphones in front of them if that's comfortable to them. And we're asking anyone who has a question to come to these microphones over here because it is being recorded. Um, so if anyone would like to, I think you had a, a question, come forward. I have one question for Nick and one for Justice Anderson. Nick, uh, since computers are so good at gerrymandering, uh, could and do they already have computer programs that are partisan blind, where they take the principles put in the program and give them everything except partisanship. And how do those districts compare to the district maps that actually get drawn? That's a great question. So if the people who draw the maps wanted a partisan blind uh, process, they can get that through the algorithms and the computer programs if they want it. Um, I would not, I'm hesitant to say that that's ever happened before. <laughs> Uh, at least not recently by like, like the legislatures. I'm sure when the courts do it, they'll, they're, they try to be partisan blind. But obviously, you know, when we're talking about, um, you've probably heard Whitford v. Gill. There's also a case from Maryland that is based off of partisan gerrymandering uh, where it was intentionally designed to disadvantage a party at, in North Carolina, as Justice Anderson yeah. said. Um, so it's possible, absolutely, uh, whether or not the people who draw the maps will use it is really up to them. And that's part of the reason for the reform efforts. Okay, and the question to Justice Anderson is, because there is this principle of least change, have we institutionalized gerrymandering where it already exists? And will it be very difficult to change 
uh, those districts that have been grossly gerrymandered in various states? Uh, yes and no. Uh, it depends a, b a bit of on what the federal Supreme Court is going to do in the state courts. I mean, what's happening in uh, Pennsylvania is it's just a 50-50 state, okay? But you have 13 and 5 uh, Republicans versus Democrats, but the Supreme Court is dominated by Democrats. And so that's how you have the Supreme Court coming down and saying, uh, so, I mean, politics, either a big P or a small P, are in play uh, everywhere. Uh, I'm hoping that what the uh, Supreme Court will do will uh, articulate enough sufficient criteria that will indicate what's wrong, and then the parties who are redistricting will not hopefully want to come too close to the edge of violating those standards. And if you have the combination of that, you're likely to get rid of some of the, uh, the gross uh, uh, distortions in redistricting. Uh, never underestimate the cleverness of people to promote their own ends, okay? <laughs> and I want to touch on one thing about, uh, Nick talked about sweetheart redistricting. A dirty secret in politics is sometimes even people from both parties will make their sweetheart deals to protect their own self-interest, which may not be in the interest of the broader public. I've seen it all the time. You hope that it doesn't exist, but you know we're populated. Our system of government by human beings, and people are prone to do that. Yep, I'd like to point out that Justice Anderson started that question, started his answer by saying it depends. <laughs> That's how you know he's a good lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other I would questions? like to address uh, the uh, Mondale Carlson plan. Parts of it I like and parts of it I don't like. Uh, I don't think the legislators should have full range to which choose w whichever judge they want. I'm a judge, okay, and I'm going to be candid. We've got better judges and lesser judges. They're all human, and the, there's a range, and, and Betty, you know that. We have good lawyers and bad lawyers, and there's a range. Uh, if they want to go that way and have some appointment power in the leadership of the House, they should first go to the court and have not the Chief Justice, but the full Supreme Court designate a pool of judges, maybe 24, because we know who we like, who are good and whatever, and that pool would have geographic diversity, would have ideological jurisprudential diversity, then let them pick from a pool. Uh, there are 300 judges in the state of Minnesota and uh, I just, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not confident that the legislature, given free range, is going to pick the best five or seven. But if you have a, not to have the court choose who's going to be on the panel, but have a pool of judges who they think that are uh, qualified, and then that the legislature, then there's going to be some real bargaining between the appointing people as to where we do it instead of just kind of free range. I'm taking notes because uh, obviously the league is interested in these issues and uh, working towards redistricting reform of some kind. We're working very closely with Anastasia Belladonna Clarera, who is the executive director of Common Cause, and Common Cause is also uh, one of our leaders on redistricting reform. So I'm taking these notes for future reference. Okay, since you're taking notes, I'm going to bring another thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, re Nick raised the thing about judges, and Betty knows this. Betty, you know, Betty Shaw was uh, lawyers are also bound by a code of professional responsibility. That is important. I was on the canvassing board for the Emmer Dayton recount. And uh, there was gaming going on. Uh, uh, I mean, Emmer was behind by over 8,700 votes, and they were just kind of willy nilly uh, uh, objecting to ballots. Uh, some ballots that were clearly. And we had some antecedent to that is the standards that were applied by the recount count canvassing board in the Coleman Franken. And so obvious ones that were clearly acceptable under that system were being rejected. Uh, I suspected that the, and I found out, and I confirmed it later, that uh, attorney's fees was a factor in more time for attorney's fees and delay until after the uh, 
Uh, I don't think Polanyi would have played the game, but there was some hope. He said, well, if you delay it till after the first of the year, you have a Republican-dominated House and Senate in place, and we are having put Polanyi as governor by default, so all of a sudden you have, for a short period of time, control. Uh, how I was able, I did it, oh God, it was very, very hard because I had to bring, but I brought up the code of professional responsibility and the duty of a lawyer to the court and the court's duty, and I said, and, and it was dealing with the canvassing board, and I laid it flat on the line. Do you believe the code of professional contact, conduct applies to you in this situation, and do you see the canvassing board as a tribunal? Yes, yes, yes. We got that clear. The recount was over the next day. So I do not want to estimate, underestimate the impact of having someone responsible to a code. And ordinary citizens aren't. And so wh whether, how you do it, you maybe do it that they, uh, they're going to serve, they got to be bound by a particular code. But, and Betty, you know this, I mean, that keeps the standard high when you have that uh, standard of professional responsibility. Yes, I think you have another comment. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years is a long time for the districts to remain in place, and I know that you have certain kinds of percentage leeways, but to what extent do you take projected growth patterns into account in redistricting when those kinds of projections are now available? Not at all. I was going to say, to my knowledge, they do not use that information. I suppose if they wanted to, they could to some degree. The, I, I don't know what the courts would say about that because uh, that's kind of a new thought, I think. Um, in theory, they could. I don't know whether or not the courts would allow it in long term or to what I mean, degree. I'm very adamant, no. I'm not into alternate facts. I'm not into, I mean, uh, Betty, you know this, my reputation yeah. on the court, I was very assiduous Absolutely. in here. And so we have to deal with the facts before us. But I'll put in a qualification on that. A good justice in handing down an opinion also has a vision of the impact on the rule of law and the principle being handed down on the future. So, I mean, yeah, probably a good justice can see the, uh, patterns that evolve and know that, you know, more and more the concentration of population is in the uh, uh, metro area. That might become a factor and say, well, it just doesn't make sense to combine Minneapolis and St. Paul because we've got enough uh, population in this area and enough separate communities' interests. We don't have to combine the two. So, yeah, it's kind of in the background, but as far as an absolute criteria, no, can't do it. And Betty, before you leave, why don't you just state your, um, obviously you've worked with the judge as your role as an attorney, if you could just give us a little bit of that. Well, I'm Betty Shaw from the St. Louis Park League of Women Voters, and uh, I'm a political science major and uh, an, a, a retired attorney. Mm -hmm. I did work for the Lawyers Board for 22 years, and I know Justice Anderson from my time and service in public life there, and I'm a long-term member of the League. So this is an interest near and dear to my heart, and I really appreciate the quality of the information that we got today. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, hello. Hi, I had a question for both of you, and this goes for either the um, Carlson Mondale plan or any other sort of appointment of individuals on some sort of a redistricting commission, would that require a constitutional amendment to prevent a challenge based on the legislature unconstitutionally delegating its uh, legislative authority? May I answer first? You sure may. Okay. <laughs> uh, so in Minnesota, as long, my understanding, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, Justice, uh, is that as long as the legislature gets the final thumbs up or thumbs down, uh, it's allowed. They can do any kind of other commission to draw the map uh, that they please, as long as the legislature has the final say. If you want an independent commission that draws the map and that is the map, the legislature has no role in approving it, that would require a constitutional amendment. He's absolutely correct. 
Uh, <laughs> we have some precedent on that. For example, we have two what we call executive courts that exist, the Workers' Compensation Court and the Tax Court. And uh, it was, they were initially set up that they were kind of off and did their own thing. And the court held that was uh, unconstitutional. And the way they preserved the constitutionality of this court was to give final review to the Supreme Court. The way they'll preserve, without a constitutional amendment, redistricting, is set up some mechanism that the legislature is the final authority. Hi, my name is Sue Neschenko. I'm curious about if we do lose a district in Minnesota, um, what the consequences, are they thinking putting Minneapolis-St. Paul together or? Who's the they? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being I mean, the devil's advocate. I mean, so what, I guess I'm. a hunter for the antecedent <laughs> to a pronoun. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just kind of curious on your take on what do you think the implications for Minnesota are and, you know, just kind of get some of your thoughts on, the, on that. Why don't you start? Okay. Uh, there are a lot of implications. Yes, I think the Republican plan will say the best way to do it is combine Minneapolis and St. Paul. If it goes to the courts, that won't happen. I think a bigger issue would be is that uh, uh, Colin Peterson is close to retirement. Quite frankly, if we're going to lose a seat, I hope Colin Peterson runs in, he's running this time, I hope he runs again in 2020, because it might be an easier decision because uh, some of that consolidation will appear, uh, will uh, occur outstate. And so, uh, uh, so yes, you, you think about it, I mean, and it's, it's fruit basket upset. You might decide to say, well, let's take the whole upper one-third of the state of Minnesota and put that into one district, and the demographics are changing up there, and then you, you deal with uh, the other, uh, the southern two-thirds of the state in six districts dealing with the uh, uh, metropolitan and exurban area. But, uh, yeah, uh, it's going to be really uh, a, a big deal. And, uh, but it will be a lesser big deal if you have one of the incumbents, uh, congressmen who's, and when you're doing the redistricting, you might be aware of that and, uh, you know, th th thinking. So, uh, no predictions. I mean, I truly do hope that Colin Peterson runs again in 2020 and doesn't retire and uh, it would probably make the redistricting easier. Nick, did you have something to add to that or? You no. If we don't have another question, though, I have... Oh, do we have a question? Yeah, go ahead. No, that's cool. I just had another thought oh, okay. when we have time. Um, I, a bit of a cynic, I have to apologize. But um, if the role of the majority party or the goal of the majority party is to stay in the majority and the goal of the minority party is to get into the majority, then it seems putting redistricting in the hands of the legislature makes a beast that will never die. Do you have, you, exa you gave examples of Arizona and Iowa as two states that were really trying to look at a, a process that was really different, pulling it out of the legislature a little bit more, even though giving them a vote at the end, perhaps. Um, do you have a sense of how that is working in those states, if it's any better or worse um, than what we might be looking at here in Minnesota with the proposal that you described? Um, uh, or maybe what is what is really fair in, to the voters as well as the parties and everybody else concerned? Uh, so Iowa has been doing it their way with the nonpartisan staff for a while now, and to my knowledge, that's worked out pretty well. Uh, to some degree, I also have to say that Iowa only has, I think, four representatives, like four congressional districts. So it's pretty easy. They just split the state into quarter into four quarters. Um, and it's always, I think it's almost always, uh, it, they, I think it's always based on county borders, if I remember correctly. Like, they've never had to split a county. And they also have 99 counties, <laughs> so that kind of almost splits up perfectly into 25 counties per district. Uh, Arizona, because their process is fairly new, I think they're just kind of working out the initial kinks and figuring out how the system should look and work. 
Um, and like I said, this past uh, cycle, I think there were some personality conflicts on the board that kind of threw things for a loop. Um, and California, with their citizen commission, there were allegations that, you know, like you would have, I think there was one allegation where, because they do an open session, which is kind of what I, one of the things I wanted to talk on, mm -hmm. um, but they do where uh, members of the public can come testify about what they like about the map, what they dislike about the map. And I think one of the allegations was that the commission was already slightly biased towards uh, Democrats, and then there was one testifier who was, who did not disclose that they were a lobbyist for a union which always endorsed DFL. And so it was kind of this issue of like, well, if you're a lobbyist, you should probably have disclosed that when you were testifying. Uh, so you get into those issues as well, even when you have a, a commission that's pretty open. Always understand we're dealing with human institutions. <laughs> and humans are fallible even uh, I mean, sometimes ignorance with uh, good intentions can really cause a lot of problems. And so, I mean, uh, when, when you say, is it good, better or worse? And my question is better than worse than what? Uh, I, I think on the, uh, if you take a mean, those systems are better, but any system is subject to corruption and manipulation. And, uh, and so I, I, any system that we have I've become more and more enamored with the wisdom of our uh, uh, founder, founders with the separation of powers. I think that any system can't be unitary in and of itself. There have to be some checks and balances. You saw that when I said, let the Supreme Court choose a group of pool judges and then go from there. And so it's any system, that if it's going to work, is that it's uh, going to have to be designed so it can minimize the amount of... Uh, opportunity for corruption or uh, manipulation. So on the bottom line to your question, yeah, they're better than most, but they're not perfect by far. And then Nick, why don't you share your last Sure, I had, I had two thoughts. The first was um, on the commissions. Uh, if it's a citizen commission, sometimes I'll have additional rules about who it can and cannot be sitting on that. Uh, so if you're a citizen who, like, uh, I think one of the proposals uh, in the Minnesota bill was if you're a public official or a public employee, you can't sit on the commission because you have a vested interest in what those districts look like eventually because you're essentially selecting your boss. Uh, and then uh, I think some states also prohibit lobbyists. That's what they do in Iowa, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, and that's the thing is that in Iowa, it's the exact opposite is they want those people uh, picking, you know, the, the nonpartisan staffers picking the districts who will eventually pick their bosses, so it's a little <laughs> weird. Uh, and then uh, I think in some commissions, they also prohibit lobbyists. And you can also do kind of a cooling off period so that someone doesn't you know, resign as a lobbyist in 2011 and then sit on the commission in 2012. Because So there might be a cooling off period where it's, you can't have been a lobbyist or a public official or public employee for the last two years. Uh, the second point I was going to make is that when you do have the legislature drawing the map, that can all be done behind closed doors because we don't have open meetings law that applies to the legislature or freedom of information. In here, Minnesota, we call it our Data Practices Act uh, that applies to the legislature. They can do all of their work in secret and then just come to the committee table and say, this is a map we drew, we voted on it, we approved it, bye. Uh, with other, with the plan, the, the Mondal Carlson plan, they would be required to have open meetings uh, for testifiers in at least three different times throughout the state. And in some, um, in some states, I believe that the, the commissions are also fall under the freedom of information law so that uh, you could see exactly what data they were using and what discussions they had uh, and things like that. Very important point here about public meetings and input from the public. You have criteria that are in place and then you juxtapose those criteria against testimony from mayors, city council people, counties. And so when the ultimate decider makes a decision, uh, it would be arbitrary and capricious if they didn't use what the information they got from the public in the context of the criteria they're supposed to apply. Again, another kind of check and balance. So the public uh, hearings, to my mind, are really, really important to create a record. 
Terrific, and I think that uh, everyone in this room would likely agree with the openness of the process as you are here today to learn. And again, that is one of the roles of the League of Women Voters to bring you um, information. Uh, just wanted to stress again that the League itself does not endorse any parties or individual candidates. Um, and then what I wanted to say is that this will be um, rebroadcast through the television here at St. Louis Park in about a week. Wait a second, I'm not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> you folks have taken me away from my family, my home, and my duties on a lovely Saturday after or morning uh, to come here, so you're going to indulge me uh, in a couple of things. I talked earlier about the League of Women Voters being a civic site, and I mean, if you're not the gold standard, you're surely the silver standard of, uh, uh, of a civic site, but you're naive sometimes. You really are. And uh, sometimes you approach issues that if you're right and advancing the good for the common will and the common welfare, that's enough. No, 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 it is not. Because people will exploit you, they'll manipulate you, and you'll make mistakes. And I'm gonna give you a good example. Now, some of you remember Bev McConnell. She was, uh, she should have been uh, national chairwoman in your organization by the national organization was a little knee-jerk politically correct and didn't do it, but that's my own opinion. Uh, but you have some problems there. But in 1990, you established citizen panels. Oh, this was going to be the good thing. We're going to have citizens show up. They're going to judge how the uh, candidates answer questions, whatever. Carlson campaign, we blew it on the first citizen's jury, okay? We didn't pay attention to it, and Doug Kelly was, and he stacked it. So Doug Kelly came out of that first citizen's jury, you know, looking very good. Only fool me once, shame on uh, uh, me, twice, uh, oh no, you, shame on, uh, <laughs> second, second time. So, you had three more? We got our people to show up, and I already won those. And we use those in our campaign literature or whatever. You were completely manipulated because you set up a system that, you know, looked good, but it could be used to the advantage. There are people out there that are ready to use you and your name in any kind of context, so you've got to be wary of that. And uh, the other thing is that this is a rough and tumble atmosphere right now. I mean, uh, if you can't just act for the common good like you could in the 40s or the 50s and think it's going to be, no. You've got to be very sophisticated in how you go about your business. Because what you're about is to educating the public. And I'm going to go back to Jefferson and I'm going to say Jefferson said that he knew no better repository for the decision making in a democracy than the people themselves. And if you don't trust the people to make the decision, the answer is not to take the vote away from them, but to educate them. And by the way, forces out there uh, want to take the vote away. Redistricting is one of the ways to take away or diminish. Voter ID. I mean, I worked long hours over a five, six day period to write an extensive uh, dissent to explain why what they were going on is, is wrong. So there are people, and they, they make it sound good. Just like Nick was saying is that the sophistication on the redistricting is so good, it's hard to detect. And then I'm gonna really be cheesy as I end up, okay? <laughs> uh, I, I, I talk to students a lot, and I have a presentation for students, and the title of that presentation, well, you'll get it from this song. The title of my speech is oh, uh, uh, Chris Christopherson yeah, is, uh, and uh, Fred Freeman, who wrote this. And I know the background when they did They wrote words of got it really wrong. In our democracy, freedom is not just a word, another word for nothing left to lose. It's everything to lose, and that's what you're about, to protect those freedoms. 
And the next line is, is that probably some people will be willing to uh, give it up. And the line says, feeling good is enough for me. Feeling good is enough for me and Bobby McGee. We have a lot of people who feel it's good enough. And so they're willing to give up their freedom without realizing that it's the freedom that allows them to feel that way. So, no, freedom is not a word for nothing left to lose. <coughs> it is everything to lose. And you've got to do your job to make sure that we preserve that. So, little cheesy end, but I'm very No, happy. it's heaven head. <laughs> Did not expect a multimedia presentation today, but that was a... a Great ending. Um, and so again, just if we could thank both Justice Anderson and Nick Harper this morning. And again, it will be aired on parktv.org. Um, I want to thank you so much for coming. And I'd also like to thank the West Metro Alliance of League of Women Voters for organizing this event and for its members assisting. And those uh, League of Women Voters are the Brooklyn Park, Osseo, Maple Grove area group, Crystal New Hope, East Plymouth, Golden Valley, Minnetonka, Eden Prairie, Hopkins, St. Louis Park, South Tonka, and the Wyzetta, Plymouth area. And we are grateful for the city of St. Louis Park to let us use their beautiful chambers here, and to Reg Dunlap for taping today's program. And again, you can find out more at League of Women Voters lwvmn.org, and I'm sure our speakers would be happy to spend a few minutes if you'd like to speak with them after the program. Thank you so much. <laughs>